So the necessity for rites of passage, especially in this day and age, um, is quite great. However, this particular uh, discussion is for the guide. Um, and I'm going to talk about a, a, a training program that we offer here at Rites of Passage Council for, for guides. But it's for those, uh, like some of your questions, those interested and called toward guiding others through those uh, the sense of the soul. So one of the questions around holding space, uh, creating rites of passages for others and for yourself um, so in a, in a more traditional context, um, one would not have created a rite of passage for themselves. Um, although we do the best we can in these days um, where there's an absence of uh, useful elders and initiated people. Um, but the idea being that when one enters the, the realm of, of uh, the the unknown and even the unknowable it requires a guide a guide that has at least navigated such territory in their own life and often rites of passages for others when you're when you're a guide one of the signature things that i listen to hear for from somebody that tells me they're right on the edge or they're in the midst of it is and it sometimes comes through with tears in their eyes and they say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And it's like, now, now you're at the place that you're ready. First one has to not know. Um, they have reached the, the end of their own uh, resourcefulness and intellect and uh, being able to choreograph their life. And they've come to a place where they don't know. And so... Uh, like in the story of Jumping Mouse, that's where Raccoon interfaces with Mouse. Mouse is hearing this roaring in his ears, and he can't make out what it is, and nobody else in, in Mouse Village seems to even notice it. And so, jump, and so this little mouse goes out looking to figure out what this sound is, and he runs into Raccoon. And, uh, and first, he's, it scares the shit out of the little mouse, and then Raccoon says, little, little brother, what, what are you doing out here? And the uh, mouse says, well, I, I hear this roaring in my ears and I don't know what it is and nobody else seems to be able to hear it. And I thought I would come out and find what it is and, and I don't know what it is. And Raccoon says, well, little brother, that is the sacred river and I know where it is and I will take you there and show it to you. And so he, the Raccoon guides a uh, little mouse to the sacred river and essentially turns him over to Frog. And the, the whole story begins to unfold. And in the story, Raccoon then wanders off to get something to eat. Um, and in the ways of uh, ceremonial rites of passage or initiation, this is a conversation for those that are interested in becoming uh, raccoons, as I call them ceremonial midwives, those that, that catch those people out there looking for a trailhead, looking for a new... Uh, uh, a compass bearing to somewhere on a forgotten map um, or somebody whose old maps no longer work anymore and they're no matter what they try and do with the old maps they don't take them anywhere useful and so this is for the one interested in guiding and how to um, put uh, the initiate in touch with the sources of wisdom, guidance, love, and compassion that can guide them on their way. Um, one of my teachers, Meladoma Some, uh, out of West Africa, I remember he told me one time, he said, if I could teach you everything I know, it would amount to this much. Maybe, maybe that would be half of what it would be. <laughs> uh, but if I can teach you something about the things that have come to teach me in my life and you be in relationship with those things, then you have an endless resource of, of support and wisdom and guidance. And I think that's the essence of guiding. That's the essence of um, that question about containers. Um, like when 
if the one who's guiding ceremony is not connected in sourcing their guidance from something greater than their own charismatic personality, that's a dangerous situation uh, waiting to go awry. Um, and so it is the, uh, the relationship of the guide to those other sources of guidance that help them navigate and to see the things that they alone can't see and to hear the things they alone can't hear and to be able to say the words that need to be spoken at any one time comes from relationship uh, with those allies, with those guides. Um, and, uh, and the question about guiding oneself, I think we can, we can, um, how to say this, we can off. We can bring ourselves to a lot of healing under our own guidance and, and under our own choreography of of situational guidance. Um, but you can't know what you don't know. And um, and so the kind of guides or the teachers that I'm that I'm, I'm always interested in are the ones that that can help me know the things I don't know. I don't know. It's like that's a whole nother area of information and resource that I don't even know to ask about. Um, and so when you're guiding yourself, you don't have access to the things you don't know you don't know. You can only think about the things you don't know. Um, and so having a connection with uh, your guides is an important piece, but also elders and, and people that, uh, and, and with some human skin, as we say, that have navigated the territory uh, maybe numerous times um, through those dark nights or those, you know, descents of the soul um, that can help us to find ways to navigate. Um, because when you're broken open by life um, and you're in that place of, I don't know what to do, and you find yourself at a trailhead, um, it's helpful to have a guide. Um, and if you're only navigating through the territory of what you know, there's a, a, a likelihood of navigating yourself into just a, a newer, shinier version of the same thing that you know. Um, and so those are my thoughts on um, when uh, sometimes people ask me, well, I could, uh, I could do a vision quest. I could just go out on the mountain and I'll fast for four days and nights. And I said, well, that's that's not exactly what that ceremony is. Um, that's only one little phase of the ceremony. Um, the, the four days and nights on the mountain is such as, as I, I say, that's the easiest part. Getting to the, the threshold circle from where you are, that's the hardest part. And the next hardest part is coming back. And so that's where you need your village to help you prepare, help you do ceremonies of preparation and begin to orient your often our, our Western modernized mind of how we conceptualize uh, ceremony more from a retreat kind of perspective um, into something that it was meant to be understood as, as say these um, ceremony and ritual is not something that you do uh, simply for yourself. Um, it is something you do for your community. Um, so going up on the mountain or even putting people up on the mountain as a guide, um, you put those people on, up on the mountain and you thank them for going up on the mountain for you as a guide, because they're going up on the mountain to remember more of who they are so they can come back and feed their people. Um, and so there's this, this understanding that, um, that rites of passage, initiation, rituals like this, uh, we're, not, we're not done for simply yourself. Um, that's not how uh, early cultures would think about these things. It was always done for the collective, the human and non-human peoples. And um, so in that greater context, guiding requires uh, having elders that support the guide and also have the guide having a deep relationship with uh, the other than human allies that support them. Um, when they're not, uh, when they're not able to simply do it by themselves. 
Um, so containers, <clears throat> one more thing about the question about uh, containers. Um, because we don't live in a, for most of us, we don't live in a, um, a culture of unbroken um, ritual community. Um, where ceremony and ritual is something that just wove in and out of daily life. It didn't kind of like, it often just didn't begin. It was just part of life. Um, but in Western culture, we need this thing called containers. And we need this precise way that, okay, now we're stepping in and we're, we're differentiating and delineating between this and this, and we're stepping in with this intention and now we're holding space in this way, and then we end uh, with a real clear, precise uh, ending to the container. So there's a clear container, since our lives don't offer that uh, the way they would have for, for indigenous communities. Um, so the container for, for most of us becomes essential. A container that um, involves invocation uh, at the beginning, um, so it's clearly not simply, as I say, the personality of people running things and a container that has enough space within what happens between when you begin and when you end so that the mystery can come in. Um, what we call, there's a popular word called uh, status ritual. Uh, Michael Mead might have coined the phrase. I don't know exactly who coined it, but there's this thing called status ritual and radical ritual. Status ritual is that which is predictable and choreographed from start to finish. There's no, no real question about what's going to happen. And you just go through the motions. Um, there's no room for, for spirit to get in there. You've choreographed it. Radical ritual is once you step in the container, um, aside from there being loose choreography, your job now is to pay attention. Um, because things begin to happen that you need to pay attention to. And that's where the mystery and the radical experience comes in when you have that spaciousness in, in the middle of uncertainty and unknown. Um, another reason why it's hard to choreograph uh, your own uh, rite of passage, um, because you need, you need a container that gives you an experience where you're, you find yourself in the unknown. Um, something's holding you other than yourself. 